physics of the answer and say, yeah, that makes sense. I believe my answer. Got the right units, got the right limiting behavior, got the right sign. It's one thing I usually check. Sign in here is correct, and out here is correct. And then uh, what was the last thing? Ah, uh, plausibility, right? It's often the case, plausibility. It's often the case that I can't check plausibility unless I pump the numbers in. So plausibility, I can't check until I stick in numbers. So if I stick in numbers, what do I get? Two, uh, H is one meter. G is 10 meters per second squared. All right, uh, let's see, what's that going to be? It's uh, two over, it's like a fifth, square root of a fifth. Well, I can't do it exactly, but I know square root of a fourth is a half. So this is like a round a half, square root of a half, maybe a third, right? What do I have, meter squared per second? Uh, no, no, sorry, second squared. Right, so this whole thing is on the order of a half of a second. You guys buy that? That's just seat of the pants, simple. It's really useful to be able to look at something like this and get a feeling for the magnitude of it, get a factor of two just with an estimate. Um, so, oh, great, so one over, yeah, square root of a fifth is a round of a half, um, and it's a second. So half a second, is that reasonable? Is that about how long it takes? You know, start, stop, yeah, it's a little bit less than a half a second. So I think that's correct, it's plausible. All right? So that's what happens if we're asked to find how long something takes. We could be asked other things, though. We could be asked, how fast will the ball be going when it reaches the desk? Right? There's a lot of discussion. It's fine. But I'm sure, is there anything, is there a question? Is it seem all right? It's fine if you guys talk it over. Just make sure there's nothing confusing. So we can, we can ask, how fast is it going into the table? Right? So now we're being asked, you know, what's, and you can be semantic and say V sub F. We're just going to call it V because our equations automatically assume that there's, that is the final, so it hits the table. What is that? What is, how fast is it going? Well, we already know. We've already calculated the time. Right? So that makes it pretty quick for us. We can go up there and assume we know t, and then find an equation that, that tells us the thing we want, given what we know. Given what, we, um, what we know. We know t, we know a, we know v naught. So that means we can use v equals v naught plus a t. Right? That's easy. What's that going to be? v naught is equal to zero, right? It starts from rest. A is equal to uh, minus g. So v is going to equal let's see, minus g times our final t. What is our final t? It's square root of 2h over g. 2h over g. Actually, I have two g's floating around. I can simplify this expression. If I put the g inside the square root, then I have to square it in here. G squared over G is just equal to G. So I can just rewrite this as negative square root of 2HG. Is that right for everybody? Once again, I go through my list. I'll just do it real quick. Do the units look right? Meters per second squared times meters is meters squared per second squared. Take the square of that is meters per second. I'm looking for a velocity, meters per second. Units look good. All right? How about the sign? I got a negative sign here. Thank goodness I got no imaginary numbers. I got a positive inside my square root, but I got a minus sign in front. Does that make sense? Is the velocity negative of the ball when it hits the table? What's my convention? Positive x axis points up. So yeah, given my convention, I had better get a negative velocity for the final velocity. Right? Very good. So I've got that. And then plausibility, yeah, we can stick in our you know, 10, and this is a 1. Uh, okay, 20 squared to 20. What is that? Six, uh, front is 4, 16, so a little over 4. Uh, it, it's minus 4 meters per second. 4 meters per second. Does that seem reasonable? Um, yeah, it's pretty reasonable. Like, this is 1 meter per second, right? Start, stop. That's like 1 meter per second. It's going faster than that when it hits the table. It's going about 4 times faster than that. That's about right. If I got 40 meters, 40 meters per second, then I'd be dubious. That's pretty fast, right? You'd break my hand, you know, if I were um, put my hand on the ball. And that didn't happen. So, so this, is, this seems plausible. Okay, good. So, that's, so, so there's some uh, basic kinematics, one dimensional kinematics. So now I want to move on to, uh, like, and real quick I'll mention, there's other questions we can ask too that are much more complicated. Right? I can ask, like, what's, how, how far does it travel in the last 0.01 seconds uh, before it hits the table? And you could solve that using these equations, but now you've got multiple times in the problem. I'm not going to go through that right now because I'd like to cover a couple of things first. Um, but everything we've done so far has been pretty simple. There's been one object moving at constant acceleration in one dimensions. There's only two times in the problem. There's time initial and time final, right? So that means we can just take these equations in their straight out of the box vanilla form and just plug in stuff and get the answers we want. But if I start asking questions like that, if I say, oh, how far did it travel in the last 0.1 second before it hit the table? Now we've got a t initial, we've got that 0.1, whatever I said, 0.1 second before it hit the table, and we've got the time at the table, right? And at the beginning of the problem, we don't even know what time at the table was. So we've got three times in the problem, and only one time do we actually know. So we have to start thinking about how to relate, using these equations to relate the different times in the problem in a smart way. Um, and that's what you're going to be working on over the next week and a half and, and, and through the rest of the semester. But that's one of the early things to work, one of the things that you learn how to handle by doing kinematics problems, one dimensional kinematics problems, getting good at your bookkeeping and keeping everything straight. Doing exactly what I just did, but, just, but can proliferate when you have lots of objects and lots of, and lots of uh, um, different times in the problem. So before I launch into, uh, so to speak, uh, the student math is a terrible pun. Before I launch into unintentional, um, most of my bad puns are intentional. But anyway, so um, but if I tickle myself, I'll laugh out loud. So, the, if, if, so, if I, so if I'm going from, uh, if I'm going to shoot the ball to the side here, I can ask all kinds of questions um, about the relative speeds of the balls or the relative timing for them to, you know, so I'm, oh, and I'm going to lose the ball. I have to pay for it if I lose it. So I got to break my wits about me. All right, so I'm, I'm going to go uh, shoot it out like that, right? So you've already seen this other one drop. Now I've got another ball that gets shot straight out the side. And so this is really going to form a trajectory that's two dimensional, right? I mean, it's moving this way and it's moving that way. I can't reduce it just to one one-dimensional problem. It's often the case in this class, like the, the ball on the ramp. You can reduce that to a one-dimensional problem. You can ignore the fact that it's in a three-dimensional world. You can just describe the whole problem with just one x axis. This problem, though, really is two-dimensional. The ball's got motion in two different directions, but it'll turn out that those two dimensions decouple in a useful way. It'll make it easy for us to just use these one-dimensional equations to solve the full problem. So before I get into that too much, I want to talk to just briefly remind you, jog your memory about some stuff. If, you're, if this stuff is all happening, you're used to it. That's great. If it's been a while since you've thought about vectors, then spend some time on it between now and midterm. You know, don't, don't wait to find out if you know vectors or not. So, uh, so what do we mean by vector? If I have a vector, I'll usually indicate it with an arrow on top. There's lots of ways I can represent this thing. I can have a sub x, a sub y, right? So what is a vector? A vector is an ordered list of numbers. Now, if you ask a physicist, she'll say, well, actually, it has transformational properties and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of properties vectors have. There's vector spaces. If you, ask, if you ask a mathematician, right, they'll have this listed. But in this class, the main thing to worry about is when you see a vector, it means really it's compact notation. Physicists love compact notation for two or three numbers, a sub x and a sub y. So this is the component of a along x, the component of a along y. I can write it another way. I can say, oh, a sub x. Oh, by the way, these are numbers, right? a sub x is some number. It can be positive or negative. All right, a sub y, another number, positive or negative. And this is a unit vector. Who has never heard of, or you can't remember if you've ever heard of a unit vector? So unit vectors are
This thing has units of meters per second. Well, so does its length. It also has units of meters per second. A unit vector has no units, and its length is equal to one because this thing has length, whatever length it has. And this is the same. This is this guy's length, right? So if you divide it out, that means that this item right here, this unit vector, has no units and has unit length. Well, I guess that's why they call unit vectors as unit length. Length is one, um, but it doesn't have units in the sense of meters or seconds or kilograms or any of that kind of stuff. So when I put i hat, what do I mean? I mean a unit vector that points in the direction of the x-axis. So the convention is that you have your, your axes, you draw them, and by the way, these are perpendicular to each other. Um, there's, and there's, there's lots of ways to say perpendicular, right? Perpendicular, right angle, orthogonal, normal, at right angles, uh, 90 degrees, 108, 100, excuse me, is that right? Yeah, 90 degrees, pi over two radians, all those things mean perpendicular. It's all the same. Um, so we've got these two axes, they're perpendicular to one another. If I'm going to represent some vector on here, and we're going to be using, I think I'm, I'm not using notation to say that we're using affine geometry, but if that doesn't make sense you, forget it. All I'm saying is that vectors can be translated around, they can be moved around. We don't care where the, the, the tail of the vector, where the vector starts from. It doesn't have to start at the origin. It can start anywhere. I can put it up here and end it up here. So don't worry about it. if you see vectors floating around the diagram, they aren't always coming from the origin. That's okay. So I've got some vector A right there. How can I represent that? Well, I'd say it can have it has a component that points in this direction. Here's my i hat, little unit vector that points in the x direction. And there's a little j hat, so i, j, k, like x, y, z. i corresponds to x, j corresponds to y. We seldom have three-dimensional problems in this class, so i and j and x and y are all I have to worry about. And I can represent A this way. I'd say, oh, if I have if I lined up A with the origin, so I can just draw it along like this, I'd say, okay, if here's my A vector, here's this distance right here, right, is A sub x. A sub x is the value along the x coordinate. If you put the vector so it's tail right at the origin. A sub y, right? So a sub x and a sub y are numbers. I chose to draw my a vector, so it's going in the first quadrant, right? So it's pointing up that way. That's why these are both positive, but it didn't have to be that way. The vector pointing that way, you have a negative x component, positive y component, right? Good. So that's different ways I can write a vector. Here's a special type of vector called a unit vector. You can have unit vectors pointing in any direction. Any, any vector you've got, you can, you can figure out the corresponding unit vector that points in that vector's direction, okay? And that's all I did for this. I, I said, ah, I'm just going to define the i hat vector pointing in the x axis direction, j hat in the, in the y direction. Great. And, if, and then there's lots of things you can do vectors, right? You can add them, you can subtract them. Real quick, I'll, I'll add a couple vectors and subtract them, and then I'll start doing more physics. So if you have a plus b equals some other vector, what do I mean by that? One way to write down mathematically say, oh, what I mean is ax plus bx. And then ay plus by. So you get some new vector whose components are the sums of these guys' individual components. So that's mathematically how you would just add them up. But pictorially, what does that mean? Oops. It means that if I want to add vector a to vector b, I use a different color. I apologize to any of you who are colorblind, but this will just help people to see it. I won't do it. I try to do anything that requires the color to understand what I'm doing, but I think it's helpful. There's a lot of stuff floating around in a different color. So the way I'm going to add a and b, right, is to take the tail of b and put it at the head of a, and then figure out what the resulting vector is. So I'll use this pink color for the resulting vector. And this point, that's a plus b. Right? That's all I mean pictorially by adding vectors. And subtracting vectors is the same thing. If I want to know what a minus b is, what I do is I first draw a, and then I draw a negative b. So b goes that way. What do I mean by negative? I mean I change the sign of b, change the direction, excuse me, of b, and leave the length the same. So that's negative b. All I did was I turned it around. And then when I look for the sum of a plus b, uh, my ring on colors, that doesn't matter. Here's, my, here's, a, here's a minus b, I should say, a minus b. See that? So that's how you subtract vectors. You just turn, it's, just, it's the same thing as summing vectors, it's just that you change the direction of the vector that has a minus sign in front of it. All right. Vectors, vectors, vectors. And then finally, if I want to, so, so vectors are vectors, numbers are numbers. What's a number? A scalar is a number. If you're a scalar, number, same thing. I want to the length of vector A. Whose theorem do I need to get the length of vector A? Yeah, Pythagorean's theorem. So Pythagoras had a, he had a cult. A member of his cult, in order to get into the clubhouse, they had to know the Pythagorean theorem. They didn't have a handshake. And people in general didn't know this back in those days. So it's actually a piece of secret knowledge. But I'm telling you, without, you, don't, you know, you, just don't tell anybody. So here it is. It's ax squared plus ay squared. This was, it had, it was a secret. Anyway, so ax squared plus ay squared, he squared that. That's the length of A. This thing is always positive, right? So one thing to note here is that I've got a whole bunch of different symbols up here. I've got, so I've got all these different things. I've got a sub x. So what do I got? I've got a vector a. I've got a unit vector a. I've got a sub x. I've got um, the length of a, which I will often write as just plain old a. If I just put the, the letter a on the board with no arrowhead above it and no hat above it and no subscript on it, what I usually mean by that is the length of the vector a. It's a positive number. So this will be like g over here, my definition for the you know, you know, uh, positive 10 meter per second squared. I'll usually use capital A or whatever letter it is without subscript or anything above it as the length of the vector. When there's vectors in the problem. Look over here, we had v and we were using it to mean the sine velocity, be positive or negative. But that was a one dimensional problem that was clear we weren't talking about vectors. When there's vectors flowing around, usually what I'll mean is the length of the vector. A sub x, however, can be positive or negative, right? If the vector happens to point in the negative x direction, right? like, like, b, like, like, uh, like here, a minus b is pointing a little bit to the left. It's got a negative x component to it. That means a sub x would be a negative number in that case. So my convention is this thing can be positive or negative, but a will always be positive if it's the length of the vector. Anyway, when you write down an equation, it had better be the case that the thing on the left side of the equation is the same beast as the thing on the right side of the equation. In other words, vectors can equal vectors. You can add vectors together, but you can't have a vector equals a number, or a number plus a vector equals whatever. You can't do that. It's got to always be the same stuff. It's apples and apples, oranges and oranges. And that's another way that we keep straight what our equations are doing. All right, so what about this ball I shot out to the side? Can we calculate for it um, how long it's going to take for it to hit the table? Actually, let me take a, let me take a vote from you guys. So you've already seen me. I drop the ball straight down here. It starts from rest. It falls straight down, hits the table. We did the ball over here. It also starts from rest, but then it gets an initial horizontal velocity. Not vertical, though, right? This thing shoots it straight out to the side. So right after it gets sprung by, you know, this, this, uh, the stick hits it, right? It's not moving up or down instantaneously after the, the thing goes. It's just it's moving to the side. And then it falls into gravity and eventually hits the table, right? So let me see a show of hands. Who would guess um, that the drop ball would hit the table first before the shot ball? That was a few hands. So who would guess that the shot ball would hit the table first before the drop ball? No takers. What other option is there? Same time. Who thinks same time? So most people think same time, but only half of you have voted. So are the ones not voting just because you're asleep or you're very bored, or you don't care? Um, it's just, you know, it's a valid response. Um, or you're just not sure. Who's not sure and doesn't want to vote because you're not sure?
going to have my drop ball over. So it's backwards in the way you're seeing it. I'm just, just so I can get it just on the board. I'm doing it this way. Here's our shot ball. I'll refer to this shot ball as S and the drop ball as D, just to keep them separate. And, I'm, and the question is, how long for the shot ball to reach the, to hit the desk? All right, so let's define our axes. Let's have x axis here. Let's have y axis here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> make one axis and one y. Okay, let's make this x axis. Let's make this y. Let's do that. All right. Okay, so that means we know this is going to be y. Let's make this y zero. Make this y equal to h. Uh, here we go. Y h. Ah. Well, messy drawing. Um, great. And so now I can say, all right, what, what are we asked for? We're asked for v final of the shot ball, right? Oh no, we're not. We're asked for t. Sorry. We're asked for t final, if you like, for the shot ball. Or if you like, the time that the shot ball hits the table. And we're going to compare it against the value we've already calculated for the drop ball. Well, what equations do we get? Our acceleration now. Well, what is the acceleration of the shot ball? Is it accelerated after it, after it's flying through the air? It's undergoing projectile motion. Is the shot ball experiencing acceleration? Yes. Which way does it point? The acceleration. Straight down. Because the only thing acting on the ball is, is gravity. Yes. Um, the only thing acting on the ball is, is gravity. And gravity always points straight down. In fact, that's what you mean by straight down. That's how we define it. So that means that if I write down the acceleration as a vector, I say, okay, my acceleration for the shot ball. Uh, what is that? And this is for the entire problem. And I should be careful how I say that. When the ball's still sitting up here, being held in place before the spring goes, it's not. Uh, it's not accelerating yet. It's only after it's been shot out the side of the surface accelerating. And after it's the table, of course, then the table exerts forces on it and things change, right? Bottom line is that while it's in the air, we've got ASX and ASY, and that looks like, well, what is, what is the x component of the acceleration? Zero. So it depends on the horizontal axis. It's only the y direction. Is it positive or negative in the y direction, given my convention for y? It's negative. Negative g, right? So when we write down our, when you go back to the equations, we actually can turn all those into two dimensional equations just by putting arrows over the appropriate symbol, right? And turning x into an r. So instead of saying x, error, instead of x vector, I'll just say r vector, right? In other words, every one of those equations becomes two equations. The one that says, uh, um, the top one, right? x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half at squared becomes r vector equals r vector naught plus v vector naught plus one half a vector t squared. t is not a vector. t is always a number. But a, v, and x are all vectors now. Ah, well, should I do it? I'll do it real quick and we'll, we'll continue with this next time. I think you know what's going to happen. So I think, I, think, I think the majority of you are correct about what's going to happen. And the reason you're correct, oh, did I lose it? Oh my gosh, I lost the other ball. Oh yeah, it's in the box. All right, so we'll do one, two, three, and we'll do it. Oh. Same time. And the reason it's on the same time, we're going to see next time, is because of, because of a profound separation between the two dimensions. All right, same time.